Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm your instructor, Jim Pytel. Today's topic of discussion is AC current sources. Our objective is to introduce AC current sources and perform circuit analysis using AC current sources. Additionally, we'll discuss rules and regulations regarding AC current sources and the limitations of real-world AC current sources. An AC current source is a supply element that will push current of a given preset value through a circuit despite changes in impedance. In theory, an AC current source could push 2 amps at an angle of zero through a 20 ohm impedance as easily as it could a 20 mega ohm impedance, but the real world says differently. We'll discuss limitations of real world AC current sources in a moment, but for now we'll just assume AC current sources behave exactly like they're supposed to. Regardless of the applied load impedance, an AC current source pushes the required amount of sinusoidal current through it. Given sinusoidal AC current continually changes not only in magnitude, but also polarity, the arrow and the schematic symbols of dubious utility when considered in isolation. However, polarity is important when a circuit includes more than one source. The arrow simply implies that at the start of the analysis, current happens to be traveling in the direction of the arrow. The same thing can be said about the polarity markers for an AC voltage source. They're kind of purposeless when considered in isolation, However, they're super important when a circuit includes more than one source. Polarity markers simply imply that at the start of the analysis, polarity initiates the cycle as indicated. You'll be happy to know if we keep AC current sources at the simple level of mathematical abstraction, circuit analysis using AC current sources is exceptionally easy. With 2 amps at an angle of zero, traveling through an impedance of 20 ohms at an angle of zero, an application of Ohm's law shows us the voltage drop across it will be 40 volts at an angle of zero degrees. An application of the AC power formula demonstrates the AC current source is delivering 80 volt amperes of apparent power, of which 80 watts is directed towards real power and zero vars towards the reactive interchange. When we swap out this initial load for one with an impedance of 20 mega ohms at an angle of zero degrees, Another application of Ohm's law shows us that the voltage drop across it will be 40 megavolts at an angle of zero degrees. An application of the AC power formula demonstrates the AC current source is delivering 80 megavolt amperes of apparent power, of which 80 megawatts is directed towards real power and zero vars towards a reactive interchange. 80 megawatts. Can you see the difficulty in purchasing a real world current source? that can push 2 amps through a circuit regardless of applied load, it's not going to happen. However, if we're willing to suspend our belief in physics, sure, it could happen, and our Ohm's Law analysis gives us the necessary proof it could. The AC current divider rule is an especially handy technique when performing circuit analysis using AC current sources. For reasons I'll explain in later lectures, AC current sources are often placed in parallel with a fixed impedance and a variable load impedance. This parallel relationship is a perfect setup for the AC current divider rule. Incoming current is known, as are the impedance values. Consider an AC current source supplying 50 milliampers at an angle of zero degrees to a parallel combination of impedances. One, a fixed impedance of 480 ohms at an angle of 30 degrees. Another, a variable impedance currently set at 240 ohms at an angle of zero degrees. An application of the AC current divider rule demonstrates that current through the variable load impedance is 34.4 milliampers at an angle of 9.9 .9 degrees. Having calculated 34.4 milliampers at an angle of 9.9 .9 degrees of the incoming 50 milliampers at an angle of 0 degrees is traveling through the variable load impedance, and applications of Kirchhoff's current law demonstrates that the remaining 17.2 milliampers at an angle of negative 20.1 degrees of current is traveling through the fixed impedance. Current with a larger magnitude is traveling through the smaller magnitude variable load impedance. Conversely, current with a smaller magnitude is traveling through our larger magnitude fixed impedance. It makes sense. Accounting for phase shift, the summation of both outgoing current paths equals the incoming current. We can be reasonably certain our results are correct. An application of Ohm's law demonstrates the voltage across the variable load impedance to be 8.2 volts at an angle of 9.9 .9 degrees. Since the fixed impedance is in parallel with our variable load impedance, it can be said, no calculations needed, that voltage across the fixed load impedance to be also 8.2 volts at an angle of 9.9 .9 degrees. Voltage across elements in parallel is the same. This is the most fundamental property of parallel circuits. 
Similarly, an application of Kirchhoff's voltage law demonstrates that this drop must be caused by an equal and opposite voltage rise of 8.2 volts at an angle of 9.9 .9 degrees produced by the current source. This is the voltage magnitude and phase shift necessary to push 50 milliamperes at an angle of 0 degrees through this parallel impedance combination. Let's say we reduce our variable load impedance and shift its angle to 150 ohms at an angle of negative 20 degrees. By all means, pause the lecture and see if you can solve for current through the variable load impedance and the voltage across it on your own. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following results. An application of the AC current divider rule demonstrates that current through the variable load impedance set at 150 ohms at an angle of negative 20 degrees is approximately 40.8 milliamperes at an angle of 11.3 degrees. Having calculated 40.8 milliamperes at an angle of 11.3 degrees of the incoming 50 milliamperes at an angle of 0 degrees is traveling through the variable load impedance, an application of Kirchhoff's current law demonstrates that the remaining 12.8 milliamperes at an angle of negative 38.7 degrees of current is traveling through the fixed impedance. An application of Ohm's law demonstrates the voltage across the parallel combination of the variable load impedance and the fixed impedance to be 6.1 volts at an angle of negative 8.7 degrees. This voltage drop must be caused by an equal and opposite voltage rise of 6.1 volts at an angle of negative 8.7 degrees produced by the current source. This is the voltage magnitude and phase shift necessary to push 50 milliamperes at an angle of 0 degrees through this particular impedance pairing. Note the magnitude is less than our previous implementation. It makes sense. With our variable impedance presenting less opposition to current, the voltage needn't be as high to keep current at the desired 50 milliampere set point. Keep in mind that AC current sources aren't exclusively limited to pure parallel circuits. They could also be included in basic series circuits or more advanced series parallel circuits. Consider a 40 milliampere AC current source in this series circuit consisting of Z1, a non-ideal inductor that happens to present a complex impedance of 172 ohms at an angle of 83 degrees at the given excitation frequency, Z2, a resistor that happens to present a complex impedance of 240 ohms at an angle of 0 degrees, and Z3, a capacitor that happens to present a complex impedance of 57 ohms at an angle of negative 90 degrees at the given excitation frequency. The most fundamental property of series circuits is that current through elements in a series relationship is the same. The current source, being the only active source in our circuit, must therefore push 40 milliamperes of current at an angle of 0 degrees through the whole circuit. Source current equals current through element 1, which equals current through element 2, which equals current through element 3. By all means, pause the lecture and see if you can solve for the voltage drop across each impedance. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following results. An application of Ohm's law demonstrates that voltage across the non-ideal inductor Z1 to be 6.9 volts at an angle of 83 degrees. As can be expected, voltage across the non-ideal inductor leads current through it by 83 degrees. This is really the same thing as saying current will lag voltage across it by 83 degrees. Another application of Ohm's law demonstrates the voltage across Z2, the resistor, to be 9.6 volts at an angle of 0 degrees. As can be expected, voltage across the resistor is in phase with the current through it. A final application of Ohm's law demonstrates voltage across the capacitor Z3 to be 2.3 volts at an angle of negative 90 degrees. As can be expected, voltage across the capacitor lags current through it by 90 degrees. This would be the same thing as saying current leads voltage by 90 degrees. Application of Kirchhoff's voltage law demonstrates the current source must have a voltage rise of V1 plus V2 plus V3, or 11.4 volts, at an angle of 23.5 degrees to induce the 40 milliamperes of current through this series combination of three elements. Is it just me, or does circuit analysis with current sources seem suspiciously easy? It should, because that's the point. A current source is a mathematically pure entity that allows us to assume current remains at a constant, fixed value despite changes in impedance. We'll learn in later lectures that one can substitute specific configurations of current sources for voltage sources and vice versa and not unduly affect the result in electrical properties of a larger circuit. The point being that sometimes circuit analysis is much easier using current sources and sometimes it's easier using voltage sources. 
if we can find an equivalency between these two methods, we're allowed to make a substitution. As easy as analysis using AC current sources seem to be, they do come with some strings attached. The most important being that the inclusion of AC current sources cannot violate basic series and parallel properties, nor establish laws like Kirchhoff's voltage law or Kirchhoff's current law. Here are two rules and regulations regarding AC current sources. Rule 1. AC current sources of different magnitudes cannot be placed in series with one another. This doesn't make sense. If source 1 was pushing 30 mA at an angle of 0 degrees through this circuit regardless of applied load, and source 2 was pushing 50 mA of current at an angle of 0 degrees through this same circuit regardless of applied load, this wouldn't work out well because mismatched current sources in series would essentially fight each other to ensure current in this single path stayed at two different set points, a physical impossibility. Last time I checked, 30 doesn't equal 50, nor does 50 equal 30. This being said, current sources of different magnitudes can be placed in parallel with one another. If source 1 was pushing 30 mA at an angle of 0 degrees through this circuit, and source 2 was pushing 50 mA at an angle of 0 degrees through the same circuit, what is the total current delivered to the source? The answer via Kirchhoff's current law is 30 plus 50, or 80 mA at an angle of 0 degrees. It makes sense. Now, here's where reality steps in. What's the voltage across source 1, and what's the voltage across source 2? Don't think too hard though because I'd hate for your head to explode. If voltage across elements in parallel is the same, this is where we must necessarily make a simplification of our simplification. Rule 2. Current sources in parallel add up. We are safe to assume that these two parallel current sources act as a single 80 mA current source. If our variable load impedance happen to be set to 390 ohms at an angle of 0 degrees, an application of Ohm's law demonstrates the voltage across the current source would be 31.2 volts at an angle of 0 degrees. Before we bring this short lecture to a close, let us pause to consider the means of operation and the limitations of real-world AC current sources. A real-world AC current source is actually just an adjustable voltage source that continually monitors and maintains output current at some preset constant value. This is often accomplished through a closed-loop controller one of the most basic elements of control theory. A closed loop controller requires two basic inputs. One, some desired set put established by a user, in this case, our desired output current of 80 mA. Two, the controller must then measure the actual output of this system. In this case, an ammeter could be used to measure actual current magnitude produced by the source. The controller continually compares the desired set point with the actual output of the system. If there is a difference between the set point and the actual output, there is an error, and the magnitude of this error represents by how much the system must increase or decrease its output voltage to attain the desired set point. Consider the inner workings of an AC current source supplying 80 mA at an angle of 0 degrees to a load impedance set at 390 ohms at an angle of 0 degrees. The set point is 80 mA at an angle of 0 degrees. If our adjustable voltage source is set to 31.2 volts at an angle of 0 degrees, Ohm's law demonstrates that the actual output would be 80 mA at an angle of 0 degrees. The error in this case is 0 and the adjustable voltage supply remains at this value. Conditions will remain stable at this given load. If however the load impedance increased or decreased in magnitude or changed its angle, the present voltage setting of 31.2 volts at an angle of 0 degrees would not produce the desired current of 80 mA at an angle of 0 degrees. Via the feedback loop, this system realizes the resultant output is no longer equal to the desired set point. Via an internal transfer function, the adjustable voltage source would then increase or decrease its magnitude such that the output current settles back at the desired 80 mA. Does this process happen instantaneously? No. There is some appreciable rise time and there is some overshoot in settling. We'll examine closed loop control in much later lectures. For now, this is just the most basic of introductions. Finally, it should be noted that real world current sources have limits beyond which they cannot maintain current at a desired set point. Consider a real world current source where the adjustable voltage source inside of it is capable of supplying at maximum 120 volts. At the present set point of 80 mA, 
an application of Ohm's law demonstrates that any impedance greater in magnitude than 1.5 kilo ohms would necessitate a voltage magnitude larger than 120 volts to keep current at the desired 80 milliampere set point. As such, we'd expect this current source to operate as expected only for impedances with a magnitude less than 1.5 kilo ohms. Impedances with a magnitude greater than 1.5 kilo ohms would be outside the operational range and current might be less than the desired 80 milliampere set point. This is assuming our current source is equally rated for resistive and reactive elements, which may or may not be the case. Okay, that's about it for our introduction to AC current sources. We'll be making use of AC current sources in later circuit analysis scenarios, as well as making use of a handy equivalency between AC current sources and AC voltage sources called source conversion. In conclusion, this lecture introduced the AC current source. We learned to perform circuit analysis using AC current sources and discuss considerations regarding AC current sources placed in series and in parallel. Remember to review this material as often as you need to really drive it home. Imagine how well lab will go if you know what you're doing. Thank you very much for your attention and interest. We'll see you again during the next lecture of our series. Remember to tell your lazy lab partner about this resource. Be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech channel for additional resources and updates.